So this is uh, James Ogilvy. James and I used to work together at a company called Boulder, and we did a lot of work together on the Mount Polly project, which I've shown you a little piece or two of as, as we went. Uh, so James is an environmental engineer, as you can probably tell from his accent. Uh, he's from the UK, where he got his bachelor's and master's in environmental engineering. And for the past decade or so, he's worked at uh, environmental consulting firms in Canada, War Warley Parsons, Golder, and then for the last year and a bit, uh, Water Street Engineering, where he's a principal and senior water resource engineer. Uh, so James works with coastal engineering, marine habitat restoration and compensation, uh, mine water management, and design and construction of water infrastructure. And before I turn it over to James, which I'll do very shortly, I just wanted to kind of bring you back to that hierarchy of different types of mitigations. So we talked about different ways we can mitigate uh, significant adverse impacts. Uh, we try and avoid them. If that doesn't work, we can try and substitute a project effect. If that doesn't work, we can mitigate it to try and reduce the level of adverse impacts. And if there's some damage to the ecosystem, sometimes we can reclaim it or restore it. And so that's part of what James will be talking about. And then another side of that is sometimes there is some permanent damage that will happen and we can't really uh, re reclaim that particular habitat, but we can compensate by building some habitat somewhere else. And so that's that's a big part of, uh, of what we would do to uh, mitigate or compensate for, for effects off into rivers. And so I think James probably has a few examples of that today, but keep in mind, so sort of the two big reasons why we would need to do this. One is to re repair or restore some habitat that's been damaged. And the second is to compensate by building something new somewhere else. So with that sort of introduction and the tie into environmental impact assessment, I'll turn it over to James. And if anybody has any questions, I'm sure just pop, pop your hand up or speak up and we can kind of talk about it as we go. So over to you, James. Thanks very much for joining us. Yeah, of course. And thanks for the great introduction. You uh, covered a uh, first few of my slides there, so that's great. Um, yeah, so good afternoon. I'm James. I'm going to be talking about habitat compensation and offsetting works as related to environmental permitting. Uh, thanks to Jerry for inviting me to come and speak to you. Um, I hope what I'm going to talk about is, is interesting and maybe a bit different to the rest of your program. Um, I'll also say I'm not used to talking for an hour straight, so do feel free to interrupt with any questions or comments. Just uh, speak up or raise your hand on Zoom or, or um, let Jerry know you have a question, whatever works. So yeah, I think Jerry covered my introduction um, pretty well, but I'm a principal and senior water resources engineer at Water Street Engineering. Uh, I did my undergrad and master's in environmental engineering. Uh, yeah, I'm, I grew up in England, but I've lived here for uh, over a, over 10 years now. And um, yeah, I worked for Lee Parsons, Golder, and now Water Street. Um, so my contact details are here if you have any follow-up questions. Um, either related to this presentation or any future questions. Um, I'm happy to help anyone who's interested in this type of, type of work or who has any questions. So yeah, feel free to reach out to me through here or uh, you can also find me on LinkedIn if, if you prefer. Um, so presentation outline, kind of as Jerry said, uh, I'd like to touch upon some of the regulations and permitting. Um, what regulations are relevant for habitat compensation works, specifically in a marine environment, and what permits are required. I'll also touch upon habitat offsetting plans, which are the main kind of technical document that covers the requirements for these permits. Um, and then I have some case studies. So I've, I've done a lot of design and construction work. So I'd like to talk about a few real life examples of um, design and construction projects. So uh, I'm glad to hear that Jerry's already talked to you about Mount Polly. Um, that's been a big project in my career and I have some, uh, some slides and some pictures to talk through the habitat compensation and mediation works that we did there. And then two other smaller examples, um, one in House Sound, uh, which was a proposed gravel pit for Burnco and one uh, Pemberton Meadows, which is a residential property um, that I thought was a, a bit different to show a range of kind of large infrastructure to 
to medium infrastructure to uh, residential. So the objectives of my slides are really to provide some insight into habitat compensation as part of the environmental impact assessment process and um, provide some examples of how it integrates with that kind of overarching process. Um, I'll summarize some of the re relevant regulations and permits that are applicable, both um, provincial and federal. Um, obviously, environmental impacts can be anything um, from wildlife, vegetation, noise, air quality, water quality. Um, I'm going to focus more on impacts to fish and fish habitat, just because that's been my area of works. So uh, impacts to the marine environment. Uh, and I'm going to focus more on the engineering and design and construction of compensation works rather than the biological or um, kind of monitoring or assessment of things. Um, and finally, I have a few, like I said, I have a few case studies to provide um, some rough examples of how that compensation works and an idea about how projects are developed, um, typically through a kind of design permitting and construction approach. So yeah, I'll start with regulations and permits. Um, yeah, and the first one I wanted to cover was the environmental mitigation policy. Uh, so that's the, so these are the provincial regulations that kind of fall under this umbrella of the environmental mitigation policy. It's BC's policy um, and it has a set of supporting procedures that provide the process for proponents or applicants to make informed and um, kind of technically based decisions about how to, to use natural resources and how, how um, those projects will impact the environment. So the procedures, the policy and procedures uh, provide guidance and tools for projects that require environmental mitigation. And these are relevant for proponents, like I say, but also uh, independent qualified professionals or consultants like um, myself and Jerry, um, government staff um, who are involved in the permitting process, and also the ultimate decision makers within, uh, within government. <clears throat> the um, procedures provide guidance and tools for projects, um, and they're, they're flexible. So the, the guidance allows flexibility depending on the type of project, the project conditions, um, kind of what, what the impacts are. So it's not a one size fits all policy, it's, it's, it's quite adaptable. Uh, it helps to develop an understanding of environmental values <clears throat> and to mitigate negative impacts to the environment and local communities. Uh, and as Jerry mentioned, the kind of the cornerstone of, of, of all of these um, regulations is, is an approach that's focused on avoiding impacts ahead of minimizing or offsetting them. So, Basically, uh, all feasible measures to minimize impacts should be considered before you move on to works to compensate those impacts. Um, and finally, though the environmental mitigation policy on its own doesn't create any legal requirements, it does support a wide range of existing um, legislations and laws, um, such as the one shown on the screen here. So proponents, applicants, when you're working on um, applications for permits and for approvals to these kind of works, encouraged to follow the policy and procedures when, you know, when planning works and submitting applications under, under any of these legislations. Um, so this is the bit of flowchart that's contained um, within the uh, policy. Um, or sorry, within the procedures um, of the policy. And it provides a kind of overview of the process and some context for how um, the environmental impact assessment process fits into the kind of umbrella of the environmental mitigation policy. So starting from on the left-hand side, from identifying your project or activity, um, 
and then determining environmental values and components through to the EIA process, applying the mitigation hierarchy and measures, and then developing mitigation and monitoring plans through to the, to the final decision. Um, and a key thing to point on the bottom here is, is all of these steps and actions are supported by both the collection and exchange of data and information, as well as ongoing monitoring and reporting. And it, it really shows the importance of data collection, analysis, monitoring, modeling, all these, all these things that are done throughout the process to support the overall permitting process and ultimately the, the decision that's made. Uh, so yeah, so the, I'm glad the videos work. The provincial website actually has a couple of really good videos that provide a, a summary of the environmental mitigation policy and procedures. Um, so instead of recreating that into slides, I thought I would just play the videos for you. They're only a couple of minutes long. Um, so the first one here provides an overview of the policy and procedures. And um, yeah, hopefully, hopefully this works for you guys. When applications for developments are submitted to government, decisions must be made with the assurance that social, economic, and environmental values are respected. The environmental mitigation policy is a provincial policy that provides guidance and tools for project proponents planning environmental mitigation associated with development projects in British Columbia. The environmental mitigation policy does not replace any existing BC legislation or create new legal requirements. Rather, it supports various acts such as Environmental Assessment Act, Water Sustainability Act, and the Land Act, to name a few. The foundation of the policy is the mitigation hierarchy, a stepwise way to consider avoiding impacts, minimizing impacts, and restoring areas before moving to the final option, an environmental offset. Together, the policy and accompanying procedures lay out what information should be considered when determining which values are affected by the project. And they underscore the linkage between the type of impact occurring and an appropriate mitigation measure. The procedures document that accompanies the policy contains all of the principles and considerations for how to use the policy to guide mitigation planning for a project. Though it was developed for large projects like mines and hydropower, the environmental mitigation policy can also apply to smaller projects that may impact the environment, such as building a trail to a dock in a riparian area. The environmental mitigation policy will usually be applied to projects proposed on Crown land, but the principles and process can also be applied to developments on private land. In addition to providing guidance to proponents, the policy and procedures can also guide stakeholders and government decision makers who review development projects. The environmental mitigation policy, together with procedures, support durable, transparent decision making on projects affecting provincial lands. To learn more about the environmental mitigation policy, visit us online. Yeah, so I'd like to say, pretty, uh, pretty good video there summarizing the, the policy and the procedures. Um, so I hope that was useful. The second video here is a, a kind of example application of, of how the policy and procedures would be used in practice. Um, so this is a, a kind of hypothetical project, a, a lodge in the mountains, and I'll, uh, I'll play this one too. This is Jim. His company is planning to build a backcountry lodge in a forested area of provincial crown land. Government reviewers decided his application had inadequate information on effects of the project on environmental values, like grizzly bears and their habitat. First Nations and local stakeholders raised the same concerns. Using the environmental mitigation policy as his guide, with the help of Kathy, a qualified environmental professional, Jim gathers the information needed to explain to government, First Nations and stakeholders how environmental values will be considered during the lifetime of the project. First, Kathy determines which environmental values and components may be affected. She quantitatively evaluates the project's impact on all environmental components and concludes that the lodge will likely impact grizzly bear berry feeding habitat 
She then follows the mitigation hierarchy and considers all possible measures to avoid predicted impacts, minimize them, and restore impacted habitat on site. Jim can avoid impacts on grizzly bear berry feeding habitat by building the lodge in a different location, but the other locations will impact other values. Next, Jim and Kathy look at minimizing the impact by merging the lodge with other buildings to reduce the project's total footprint. Nonetheless, there's still some predicted loss of berry feeding habitat. Kathy recommends the lodge be closed during the fall berry season to reduce the impact of the lodge on the bears and minimize the potential for bear-human conflict near the lodge. She also looks at options to restore affected habitat and determines that Jim should not plant foods that bears eat close to the lodge and instead plant non-edible native species. Next, Kathy determines that there will be a residual impact on the berry feeding habitat component even after all mitigation measures are implemented. Restoring an old logging road 10 kilometers away is identified as an off-site offset project to counteract the residual impact. Following the environmental mitigation procedures, Kathy factors in timeliness, uncertainty, and risk to determine an appropriate offset ratio. That is, more habitat will need to be restored than will be impacted because it may take a few years before the restoration work is finished and the habitat becomes functional for the bears. In addition, Jim's company commits to funding maintenance and monitoring of the offset to ensure the restoration project is meeting expectations. In his application, he describes all mitigation measures considered, those that will be implemented, and a rationale for his decisions. By applying the environmental mitigation policy and procedures, all decision makers fully understand the predicted impacts of the project on environmental values and are satisfied that the right mitigation measures are in place. First Nations and stakeholders are also assured their concerns are addressed. Jim's application is quickly approved and he's able to start his project swiftly. To learn more about the environmental mitigation policy, visit us online. Okay, great. So yeah, hopefully that gave a good example of how the policy and procedures are applied. Um, and yeah, that's uh, so that, that's the provincial uh, regulations, the provincial policy that, that governs um, offsetting compensation works. There's also the, the main federal policy, or at least the main one that I'm involved in is, is the Fisheries Act. Um, so on uh, the next few slides, um, cover the, the Fisheries Act and its requirements. So the Fisheries Act is the main federal legislation to manage Canadian fisheries. Uh, it gives DFO, uh, Fisheries and Oceans Canada, the power to conserve and protect fish and fish habitat across all of Canada. Its main objectives are to manage and control fisheries, conserve and protect fish, protect fish habitat, and prevent pollution. And similar to the provincial environmental mitigation policy, the Fisheries Act has a similar hierarchy of measures. They don't quite use the same terms, but it's the, the exact same concept. Um, basically says all, all feasible ways of avoiding impacts must be considered before moving on to mitigating impacts or offset impacts. So, James, it's interesting. They don't have restore or reclaim on this one. No, they do not. Um, so that's that's the difference between this one and the the uh, the provincial policy is is they go from from mitigate directly to, to offset, um, but offset includes habitat restoration and as 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 one of the possible measures. So I think that's kind of where they incorporate that. Um, but yeah, hierarchy of measures um, kind of emphasizes, prioritizes the, um, the order in which efforts should be made to avoid impacts. So yeah, first to avoid the occurrence of adverse effects by, um, well, similar to you saw in the large example, by, by moving the project footprint or changing the project layout, that kind of thing. Uh, when avoidance is, is not possible, then efforts should be made to mitigate impacts through um, mitigation measures to, to minimize the expense of impacts 
And finally, as a, as a very last resort, any residual adverse effects should be addressed through um, efforts to compensate for loss of fish or fish habitat um, through, yeah, through positive contributions to the ecosystem, either in the, in the project area or, or close by in other, in other environments. Uh, this is quite a nice diagram, kind of shows graphically how the hierarchy of measures works. Um, so the, the effects on fish and fish habitat is, is the y-axis, with negative effect being below the middle line there and positive above. And you can see kind of working from left to right, the initial predicted effects are um, the, the red, red block there. Um, so that's the initial predicted effects. And then moving to the right, you see the, the residual effects that are left once measures to avoid are considered. Um, and then the, the third block, you can see the residual effects once measures to avoid and me measures to mitigate are considered. And then finally, the remaining residual effects need to be out of balance by measures to offset. So the net, um, the net change or the net impact is, is zero. And that's where the, the offsetting um, plans and offsetting designs come in when, when there is a residual effect that requires compensation. Um, yeah, so the provisions of the Fisheries Act protect um, fish and fish habitat, including, um, so the requirements are to incorporate measures to avoid anything that would cause the death of fish or anything that would cause harmful alteration, disruption, or destruction of fish habitat. Um, that one's a bit of a mouthful, so it's often called HAD, or the acronym HADD. Um, so if you see that, that's, that's what that is. So there's, to, to incorporate those measures, there's, there's various typical measures that could be considered. And I'll, I'll kind of run through the list just so it's, it's clear what what you'd look at at that initial stage of the project. Um, so preventing the death of fish, I mean, that's fairly obvious that anything that would kill fish. So um, avoiding the use of explosives or construction equipment in water, um, plan work to respect fish windows, um, such as, you know, windows for spawning or migrational periods. Um, so those are the those are the kind of main uh, mitigation measures for preventing the death of fish. Um, maintaining riparian vegetation. This includes the kind of riparian zone above the high water mark. So this could include things like using existing access roads, um, avoiding removing vegetation, um, avoiding any methods that would damage the, the surrounding ground or soil or vegetation. Uh, carry out work on land is basically avoid any work in the water where possible to so avoid disturbing riverbanks or riverbed, avoid building any structures that may result in erosion, um, or avoid working in areas that are kind of unstable, prioritized work on, on land. Uh, maintaining fish passage, so this is really just avoiding kind of major or dramatic changes to flow or water level, avoiding obstructing um, channels, obstructing fish passage, or interfering with fish passage or migration in, in any way. Um, ensure proper sediment control. This is things like avoiding introducing sediment to water, quite simply. So any, anything like silts or sands or clays um, that could get into, into the stream. Uh, typically, you're required to develop and implement a erosion sediment control plan. And that's typically part of your permit applications to kind of set out how, um, how erosion and sediment control will be managed and what control measures, inspection, maintenance plans, that kind of thing would be included. <clears throat> and finally, um, preventing the entry of deleterious substances into water. And this can be uh, anything from anything spills, right? Anything from uh, contaminated water to um, spills from construction equipment, um, runoff from concrete, paint products, any other kind of chemicals used in construction. <clears throat> 
Um, anything that can impact water quality in a negative way needs to be prevented. <clears throat> so, yeah, these are the main measures that are used to, to mitigate impact. So we have avoid, mitigate, and then finally offset. So there are various measures to offset impacts, and they're listed here in, in general order of priority. Um, so first is habitat restoration um, and enhancement. And I, I, I think this is the, the kind of the difference that, that Jerry noted that the habitat restoration is, is actions taken to, to restore damaged habitat and, and habitat enhancement is um, actions taken to improve existing um, habitat. So there is, a, there is a difference in, in DFO's mind whether you're kind of repairing damage or, or just enhancing what's naturally there. Um, but both, uh, <clears throat> both of those basically cover physical works to improve habitat, to improve a habitat's capacity to, um, to produce and support fish populations. So yeah, examples of, um, examples of habitat restoration or enhancement could be increasing coarse material to improve habitat conditions. So that's typically things like gravels or woody debris or boulders or things that add complexing to a channel. Um, increasing shoreline complexity, stabilizing areas of erosion, revegetating riverbanks or riparian areas, um, improving access to off-channel habitat. Sometimes off-channel habitats get isolated through sedimentation, whether natural or, or humanly accelerated. Um, removing fish barriers is a, is a big one. You know, a lot of, especially like logging roads, will put in culverts that um, you know, weren't properly designed and, and over time erode and form barriers to fish migration. So that's, uh, that's a way to um, res effectively restore some damaged habitat. Um, and improving hydraulic conditions to favor certain functions of fish. And that's really looking at um, spawning. So spawning of certain fish species require cer certain depths of water, certain velocities, in some cases, certain temperatures. So there are things you can do with the, the hydraulic design of, of natural systems to um, kind of improve those, those conditions to favor functions that you're looking to, to improve. Um, <clears throat> habitat creation. So not the, the second, uh, second item that, that typically includes creation of, of habitat in an area that was previously not aquatic habitat. So, um, like a terrestrial area, for example, an upland area. So examples of this include creating, um, side channel habitats or lakes or, or salt marshes or wetlands, um, or expanding any of those existing habitats into, into new areas. So that's the, the, the second in the, the kind of list of um, offsetting options. Um, the, the last two are really less common. Chemical or biological manipulation covers measures such as um, manipulating water bodies to, to fix or address water quality problems. Um, or stocking of fish or shellfish. Sometimes, um, sometimes the government will, will dump a load of fish into a certain water body to um, kind of facilitate repair or recovery of fish populations. <clears throat> um, another one in that category is um, kind of management or control of aquatic um, invasive species. Uh, and that could be... Um, fish or bugs or, or sometimes vegetation as well. <clears throat> um, and finally, complementary measures. This is really the last resort. These are actions like data collection, research, um, things that complement um, habitat productivity, but don't directly um, kind of improve anything. Um, these are typically considered in areas where there are either limited opportunities for kind of on the ground offsetting measures 
um, or where there's limited understanding or, or data on fish populations. Uh, I've seen these accepted in kind of in the Arctic where there isn't a lot of information available on, um, for example, the migration of, of whales or, or, or seal populations. Um, typically it's limited though, you, you can only, you can only normally get away with kind of 10% of the required offset amount. They, they won't let you just uh, do years worth of studies and, and call that offsetting. So, so yeah, these are the main measures to offset. And I'll touch upon a few of these in, in my case studies, um, particularly numbers one and two, because that's generally where the, the engineering comes in to restore, enhance, or create a habitat. So just a summary, really. Um, so I've touched upon the environmental mitigation policy that's the kind of overarching policy for um, the provincial legislation. And I've touched upon the Fisheries Act. Um, specific to marine works, this list kind of summarizes the relevant permits in, in BC that, that you would need to apply for if you're applying for a project um, here in this province. <clears throat> so. Approval under the Fisheries Act is, is called the request for review process. Um, and there's kind of, there's two outcomes of that um, request. You either need, to, they either deem that there are impacts and you therefore need to apply for an authorization under the Fisheries Act, or they deem there's not, and they um, will give you a letter of advice. So their, the kind of purpose of their review is to assess whether your project will impact aquatic species and um, identify if if it could cause the result of, of if it could cause death of fish or um, yeah if it needs an authorization under the Fisheries Act. <clears throat> the Water Sustainability Act is the provincial policy. So Section 11 is the most common application that I come across, and that refers to changes in and about a stream. And again, there's there's kind of two options there. Um, if there's potential significant impact, then you need to submit a change approval, which is a written authorization to make complex changes in the Nevada stream. Um, and if the um, impacts are considered to be low risk and expected to have minimal impact on the environment, then you can submit a notification. And, and basically that provides a review period for, um, for Flynn Road to review your, your works. And if that review period passes and they don't come, if they don't provide any comments, then you're, you're kind of good to proceed with that work. Um, there's also the riparian area protection regulations. So um, these are basically areas bordering streams, lakes, wetlands, things like that. Um, anything that links water bodies to the land, um, to the vegetation and complexing these areas provides cover and shade and nutrients and, and it's protected. So. Um, there are guidelines that need to be followed and an assessment needs to be made by uh, typically via QEP, a qualified environmental professional. And um, yeah, that, that needs to be part of the project planning. Uh, archaeology is also a big one, especially in BC. There's a lot of archaeological sites that are protected by the Heritage Conservation Act and cannot be altered or touched or changed in any way without a permit. So that typically requires an archaeological investigation to determine if a permit's required. Um, if it is, that's uh, another permit that needs to be applied for. If not, then the archaeological investigation will give you the kind of approval to proceed with the, the proposed works. <clears throat> um, and finally, this one comes up less commonly, but it, it does come up. Um, the Navigable Waters Act um, protects any water bodies where the public has the right to travel. So typically larger rivers, lakes, um, not so much relevant obviously in streams and things like that, but um, it is relevant in yeah, larger lakes or rivers that fall under the jurisdiction of the Navigable Waters Act. And if you are working in one of those areas, there is a, there's a permit to apply for, for that too. <clears throat> So a couple more slides on permitting here. So fish habitat offsetting plans, um, sometimes called fish habitat compensation plans, 
are part of the application for an authorization under the Fisheries Act if DFO determined that an authorization is required. So if you submit your request for review and they say there are no project related impacts that concern them, then you're good to go. But if not, then you need to submit an application for an authorization under the Fisheries Act. And that application requires a lot of detailed supporting information that is typically included in, in a document like this. Um, there's actually a lot of examples of these online. I pulled all of these off Google. Um, most of them are posted as part of public review process for projects. So if you Google fish habitat offsetting plan or, or any of these titles, you can, you can find them and look at the reports in more detail. Um, they provide, <clears throat> like I say, a lot of detail on the, the project, the expected impacts, and um, if yeah, and the proposed offsetting approach. Um, like I say, to meet the requirements of DFO, DFO's authorization application form. So generally, this is what's needed to go into a fish habitat offsetting plan, um, site plan and drawing showing project location, location of project related impacts and where the, and the location where uh, proposed um, offsetting measures will be located. Uh, also need to include the description of proposed offsetting measures and an explanation of how um, how they'll be effective, how they'll meet their objectives. Uh, also a description of proposed monitoring measures. That's a big thing. You need to know how um, proponents will assess the effectiveness of the measures to offset. So DFO can be, can be confident that it's going to work. Um, you also need to provide a contingency plan, a description of contingency measures and associated monitoring measures if the selected measures are not successful. So you kind of have to have a, a plan B. Um, also need to provide a timeline um, or schedule for implementation. So when things would be constructed and, and how monitoring would um, proceed. Uh, and finally, you need to include a cost estimate. And this is an important one um, because you need to provide a cost estimate for implementation of each component of the plan, but the DFO actually requires the financial guarantee from the proponent, typically through a letter of credit or performance bond from a bank or other financial institution that basically guarantees funds are available to complete the offsetting and monitoring works. So um, this is basically there in case the proponent, for whatever reason, doesn't honor the agreement and DFO have the money available to implement the offsetting work on, on their behalf. Um, yeah, and on the right-hand side, I just I copied some of the main steps um, of developing a habitat offsetting plan. So let's go through these quickly, starting with um, characterizing the residual impacts of on fish and fish habitat resulting from the works then following guiding principles to select measures for offsetting, um, the determining the amount of offsetting required given um, habitat balance, uncertainty, time lag. Uh, fourth step is establish monitoring and reporting, describe how, um, how things will be monitored and what the contingency measures are. And finally submit the offsetting plan to DFO, including um, like I say, implementation costs, financial guarantee, and um, yeah, kind of proof of access to to land. You you can't you can't propose offsetting works on lands that you don't own or have access to. So you need to provide some some guarantee of that as well. Um, I think that's yeah, that's all I had on. Uh, Permitting regulations. So maybe I'll stop here for a minute and see if anyone has any questions on the general regulations and permitting um, before I move on to talk about some case studies. Any questions? No, nope, you're good to keep going. Okay. Um, good. Okay. Well, Matt Polly. So yeah, Jerry and I worked on this for a, uh, a number of years. In fact, I'm still working on it. Um, so I, it sounds like this has come up in a in a few of your um, previous sessions. So I won't 
talk too much about the project details, but um, just from a habitat compensation perspective, um, yeah, where's the site? You know, uh, why did it need compensation? Well, tailings down led to physical impacts. Um, the work that was undertaken to repair those impacts included restoring eight and a half kilometers of Hazeltine Creek, half a kilometer of Edney Creek, and a significant amount of shoreline along Poly Lake and Quinell Lake. So this is obviously very different to normal habitat compensation work and you know, completely different to what I've just described in the permitting process, because usually you would plan the work, ask for approval, and then, and then do it. Whereas in this case, the impacts had already happened and we had to work with stakeholders to remediate the impacts in an acceptable and um, effective way. So a bit different, but because it was such a interesting project, I have a lot of good photos. I thought it'd be worth sharing with you all. Um, yeah, so generally Mount Polly Mine, located just north of Williams Lake, um, central BC. Uh, site layout, the tailing storage facility is towards the, the south end of the site. Um, failure of the foundation materials caused a breach in a section of the, the dam. Um, you can see in the imagery the the breach led to a debris flow that went north, which is up on the screen into Poly Lake, which is the water body at the top, uh, caused an immediate rise in the lake level and then turned and flowed downstream down Hazeltine Creek into Quinell Lake, um, causing significant physical impacts to, to all those systems. Um, yeah, so significant, significant impacts to Hazeltine and Andy Creek, um, estimates of around million cubic meters of, of underlying sediments were eroded from the channel corridor, which caused, as you'd imagine, significant physical changes to the creek systems. Um, the photos on the right were from one of my first days on site in uh, November, 2014. Um, so yeah, I was, I was fortunate to be involved in this project from almost from the very beginning. Um, and as you'll see from the photos, it's been an incredible experience really to, to see the progress made by the mine and, and all the people working up there to uh, to remediate the, the landscape and um, yeah, see the progress that's been made. Um, so yeah, we'll talk about the remediation efforts as related to um, fish and fish habitat compensation. Um, planning, design and construction began as soon as it was safe to access the creek. So we couldn't initially get into the area um, because of geotechnical concerns related to the stability of the, the tailings material that was that was left behind. Um, so this was the first time we went to look at the site in um, November 2014, like I mentioned. You can see in this, this image, this was the, the previous, previously would have been the, the creek corridor. You can see now the channel lacks any kind of definition or anything resembling a normal geomorphic structure. The water is cloudy, um, suspended materials, there's no forest or riparian vegetation or or fish habitat in the creek. And uh, just a spoiler for, <laughs> for later, this is um, taken from a similar position, um, September 2020, so, so nearly six years later. Um, so here you can see the restored creek on the, on the right-hand side, um, defined creek channel structure, returning riparian vegetation, um, and yeah, things are looking a lot better. So I'll just talk about a little bit about the design. Uh, it was a bit different than the traditional kind of design approach, but we initially had to do some studies to support the construction and establish the design criteria. So this included uh, field, field investigation, assessment, tumor morphology study, LIDAR mapping of the topography after the breach, um, hydrology study, and fishery study. And a big part of it was cons consulting with stakeholders and um, yeah, local, local residents and First Nations groups and, and really getting input on the, the history of the creek and the objectives of the creek and where we should be focusing our remediation efforts. Um, in terms of the design steps, um, as I mentioned, this was an unusual process because we didn't have time for the traditional design permit construct model. So we adopted a field fit design and construction approach that meant we could get started right away. Um, and it's kind of based on these 
main steps. The approach was unusual, but was agreed to by the government working group that included the mine um, representatives from the government and First Nations and, and technical consultants uh, like, like Boulder. Um, so yeah, the key steps included determining the slope of each reach, calculating the design flow based on the hydrology and sizing typical channel cross sections, um, developing habitat objectives, developing plans and profiles for each reach, and then developing and designing habitat complexing. And I'll, I'll walk through this in a bit more detail in the pictures. I have some bit of a slideshow coming up. Um, this was our initial conceptual channel section. So we had a, a main kind of low flow channel um, surrounded either side by a lower floodplain and an upper floodplain before meeting back up with the original cutbacks. Um, so this is the kind of engineering detail of that section. So a low channel, a low flow channel was designed to flow bank full annually. So kind of in line with what you'd see naturally, we didn't design it for a 10 or 20 or 200 year event. We, we wanted the, the, um, the channel to flood and the, the floodplains to be engaged. Um, the lower floodplain was designed to pass the 200 year flow, um, but that was really just a function of the space that was available. And then the upper floodplain was uh, just what naturally extended to the edges of the, the forest. <clears throat> we developed a meander pattern based on um, a geomorphological review, looking at historical imagery of, uh, of what the creek used to look like. These radiuses were used as a guide in the field to determine the alignment of the channel kind of as we went along. Uh, and then we started to look at the details once we had that um, kind of foundation alignment developed and details included habitat complexing, pools and weirs, boulders, lots of woody debris, um, spawning gravels. Um, and you'll see, you'll see this in the pictures, kind of how it, how it looks in real life. Um, yeah, so a couple of pictures here of the kind of finished conditions. You can see the, the pools and the channel sinuosity that were um, designed to match the design objectives. Um, weirs and riffles were used to, to construct pools, vary the flow regime from kind of still water in the pools to um, greater velocities over the, the riffles um, where, where spawning would be occurring at the upstream end. Uh, we used a lot of um, woody debris in boulders. Luckily, there was a lot of woody debris available following the breach. So, yeah, we made use of that for complexing in pools to provide cover and um, deeper rearing habitat. Um, you see in the pictures that the riparian vegetation is starting to return, and eventually that cover will be replaced by kind of natural elements as the, the installed features um, deteriorate. <clears throat> okay, so um, that was a bit of an overview, and I'm conscious of time here. I have a lot of uh, I have a lot of photos to go through, but I, I think it's interesting to see the progression of the works, and I'll go through them fairly quickly. The construction was carried out in two phases. The, the first phase was the initial emergency works to construct an engineered non-erodible channel, and uh, the second phase was the construction of the habitat features. Um, so I'll go through what that looked like. Um, <clears throat> so this kind of this is another picture of the, the post breach conditions. You can see signs of erosion and slumping in the channel. Water quality is obviously poor. Um, significant amount of suspended sediment being carried in the creek flow um, due to erosion of the material. You can also see how unstable the banks were, um, both within the channel and, and up towards the forest. So that posed a safety risk as well as a technical challenge for accessing and repairing the creek channel. To give some scale, the drop from the kind of center elevation there down the gray, gray clay material to the creek is about three meters in this photo, so 10 feet. Um, so fairly significant, like uh, twice my height, pretty much. Um, and there were some sections of the creek that were that dropped down 30 feet, so 10 meters. So we're talking about significant physical impacts to the natural channel morphology. Um, in the upper sections, the, the kind of vertical impact was, was less extreme. 
this picture shows damage to the floodplains and you can see the, the width of impact to the channel corridor, um, as well as the elevation change from the original tree line to the current creek invert um, and the amount of woody debris that was um, disturbed and left on the, the banks as the breach flows receded. Uh, access roads, so one of the most difficult parts of the project actually was building access roads, um, especially roads capable of transporting construction equipment and materials. Um, actually took more time than the, the work in the creek initially. Um, there wasn't access to the creek when we first got there. It was a remote site. Hizzardine Creek flowed down through the forest. There was some limited water sampling and flow monitoring sites related to the mine. But apart from that, there were very little human activity. Um, so we needed to build roads down the uh, down the floodplain and, and to, to bring in access from, from the forest. Um, before we could start working in the creek, there was still flow from Parley Lake into Quinoa Lake. You, we couldn't really stop that. So we had to construct diversions to work around the areas. It was a combination of, of ditches by gravity and pump systems so we could work in the dry. Um, flow diversions were done in, in sections, um, typically, typically a couple hundred meters at a time um, or kind of as it made sense. So keep in mind that Hazelton Creek is eight and a half kilometers long. So you can you can imagine how much effort it took to set up and maintain and then move the diversions as we were our way downstream. <clears throat> um, once we could safely work in the dry, or at least as dry as we could get it, um, we started working on clearing tailings and grading floodplains. So tailings and other kind of unsuitable material was cleared from the corridor and returned to the TSF tailing storage facility. Um, next, we used the channel designs for each reach and the meander patterns that I showed to stake out where the channel alignment was to go and then excavate the, the mean annual flood channel. Uh, then we had to haul in rock for channel foundation and armoring. Um, in the end, we hauled down 25,000 loads of rock from the mine, um, a 40 ton rock trucks, so that equates to about a million, million tons of rock. Um, they were very fortunate, of course, that they had access to that much waste rock. Uh, it would have been very, very much more difficult and expensive to do what we did without that supply of materials. Uh, once imported to the creek, the rock channel armoring was placed and shaped and compacted to form the, the kind of rough channel foundation. And to, in case it's not clear, the, the reason for doing this was because the underlying material was so soft that if we didn't have that kind of solid foundation, we would have seen um, significant erosion once the kind of habitat works were constructed. <clears throat> um, yeah, once the channel armoring was complete, uh, we'd kind of let flow into that section and then move downstream. Um, we did field monitoring and surveys as we went as part of the field fit design process, make sure everything was working out with the grades and um, tying together different sections of the creek. Uh, this is one of the initial sections um, with flow running clearly. Uh, we actually finished the creek five months after we started the main works, the, the channel foundation. So um, for eight kilometers of creek, I think that's pretty good, pretty good job. Uh, next step was floodplain reclamation and planting. Um, this, everything was done manually, and this picture shows uh, planting crews working on the floodplains. Um, every, all, all the plants, trees, willows, and seeds were, were done manually. <clears throat> um, and this picture is in a similar area, showing floodplain vegetation beginning to establish just a, about a year after the initial planning efforts. Uh, next step was habitat complexing, which was adding habitat features to the channel. Uh, this, yeah, so here you can see construction of, of weirs, riffles, and pools on top of the original channel foundation. The idea of the riffles is to divert the kind of peak flow towards the outside of the bends where the pools are deeper. It's kind of what you would see in a natural stream. Um, here you can see the hydraulics working pretty well with the new weirs and riffles uh, and the high flow to test it out. 
Uh, next step was to place body gravels. So I spent a long time screening gravels from the mine and um, to the right size, and that was all hauled down to the creek and stored. And then woody debris was placed. So I anchored in with steel gables or buried into the banks, so they remain stable. Um, woody debris provides cover, rearing habitat, and uh, additional just complexing for the stream. And these pictures were taken last fall. Um, so you can see sockeye salmon, the little red dots in the in the creek there, returning to use the creek. Um, so this was really cool to see sockeye returning to spawn in the newly constructed habitat. Um, yeah, present the presence of sockeye is is uh, great, indicating that the remediation work has been effective and um, kind of restoring the functions of the original creek. And this shows the upper creek and the floodplains after a few years, uh, showing, again, riparian vegetation returning. Um, lots of wildlife have been observed in these areas, bears, moose, lynx, eagles, and um, yeah, lots of other like bugs and snakes, spiders, lots of toads. It's really good to see the um, yeah, riparian vegetation filling in, clear flow in the creek, and uh, good functional fish habitat. And yeah, one more photo showing the constructed conditions. Um, like I say, incredibly rewarding to be involved in the works and see such a drastic change since the, the breach. And this is a drone shot that I showed earlier, just to give some context, shows the, um, it's just again taken last fall, shows the upper floodplain vegetation filling in, and of course the creek alignment and habitat features. Uh, one other thing related to Mount Polly, uh, before I move on, DFO requires monitoring of um, habitat features to confirm that they're effective, as I mentioned. Um, there's two main categories of information that need to be collected. One is that the works are physically stable and one is that the works are biologically effective. And um, the physical stability we were able to address with an innovative new technology um, using drones and we surveyed the habitat features using a drone. Um, to do that manually would have taken a lot of time. So we did it with a drone by flying the alignment once a year, creating a, a kind of stitched image of all the imagery and importing into GIS where everything could be categorized and reported. Um, this worked out really well because you could georeference all the habitat features, compare the locations year on year and demonstrate that they were stable. Um, or in some cases actually identify a couple uh, instances of, of unwanted movement. Uh, yeah, okay, so that was Mount Polly. So like I say, been a, been a bit of a landmark project for me, um, a bit different to the traditional permitting approach that I described earlier, but I hope interesting to see how the creek remediation works were carried out. Um, maybe I have a couple more shorter case studies, maybe before I move on, does anyone have any Polly, any questions? Any questions on the last case study? No? Good to keep going. Keep going. Okay, so yeah, Burnco is the next one I wanted to talk about. And this followed a more typical permitting approach. Um, so I worked on this when I was at Boulder, although all the information that I'm showing in these slides is available online. So you can look into this if you like. The Burnco gravel quarry was proposed in How Sound. Um, it needed compensation because there were expected impacts to an existing watercourse and some marine foreshore habitat. Um, work was proposed to compensate habitat through construction of a new section of channel and construction of new intertidal habitat. So if you're not familiar with the area, the proposed project is on the west side of Pau Sound, uh, 35 kilometers northwest of Vancouver. Um, located just to the west of McNab Creek, which is a fairly large catchment draining the, the north side of House Sound. Uh, the proposed project was a sand and gravel um, quarry for aggregate pro products, so to be used for making concrete and sands and things. Um, during operations, you can see on the left hand side that there'd be a floating barge in the lake and a conveyor system um, basically to excavate gravels from the, um, from the quarry and process it onto ships. 
And then on the right-hand side, ultimately at, at closure, the quarry would become a freshwater lake, um, collecting surface water and groundwater and discharging to the environment through a, a surface discharge. So there are a huge amount of baseline studies that have to be carried out over a number of years um, to characterize the, the pre-development um, conditions of the site. Uh, this included all the usual things, hydrology, water quality, air quality, um, wildlife, vegetation, et cetera. And um, one of the important baseline studies for this was the fish and fish habitat baseline, where you basically go out and do a lot of sampling and monitoring in, in all the water bodies on site and develop an understanding of fish presence, fish population, um, habitat functionality, things like that. So the, the table here and the pictures came from Golders Habitat Baseline Report. The table shows the number of fish captured through um, different study years. Uh, they also collect information on fish size, weight, things like that, but I'm just showing the number here. And then they use that to develop an estimate of fish population considering all um, life stages. You'll note uh, a huge variety in the number of fish captured um, in the table and also the habitat type and quality between the different um, habitat units. So that, that all kind of goes into the habitat balance calculation. <clears throat> um, so the approach that was taken followed guidance from DFO. So as, as I mentioned, um, avoid, mitigate, offset. In this case, efforts were made to avoid impacts um, by adapting the project footprint to stay away from aquatic and riparian areas. Um, efforts were made then to mitigate impacts by adjusting the design, the excavation depths and water levels. And finally, offsets were required to offset impacts to two uh, small areas. So a, a short section of water course two and a small area of foreshore marine habitat. Um, <clears throat> so the exact areas of impact were identified and quantified, and this is what goes into the habitat balance calculations. So in this case, there was about 3,500 square meters of in-stream habitat and 1,500 square meters of riparian habitat. So about 5,000 square meters in total. <clears throat> um, proposed offsetting included um, new and improved fish habitat, um, more area, so 23,000 cubic meters or square meters, um, and offsetting in two different areas or habitat types. So a channel extension and a construction construction of intertidal um, intertidal habitat attached to the loading dock. Um, yeah. So the proposed well, I have a next slide shows the um, proposed design of the channel extension. So the the gray beige section is the extended channel um, ties into the existing channel, which is the blue line on the right hand side. Channel extension was designed for uh, with a kind of meandering channel, shallow gradient, um, side pools for for fish rearing, and um, off-channel pools for amphibian habitat, um, and lots of riparian planting. Um, and then the sections on the left show typical sections of the channel, woody debris complexing, and the amphibian pools. Uh, so DFO reviewed this application and. This was the decision that they published. So basically saying that the project is not likely to cause significant adverse environmental effects and could proceed with standard mitigation measures and best practices. So um, that was a successful permitting application. Uh, it also notes at the bottom there that effectiveness monitoring is required, which is fairly standard. Um, so yeah, this, this was, decision was made in 2018. Our uh, project's actually been on hold since then, so I don't have any construction photos, but it, I thought it was useful to understand DFO's permitting process and how the uh, habitat baseline and how the offsetting plan um, went into the authorization application and, and the, um, the end result from DFO. <clears throat> um, okay, I have one more case study, and this is very different because it's a residential property, so I thought it'd be interesting to show the, the kind of difference between um, kind of a larger mine, um, a more medium sized infrastructure project and, and now a, a residential property. Um, so this is one that I worked on recently just north of me in Pemberton. 
Um, it's, a, it's a residential property owned by a couple. Um, they actually just bought the land. Um, they would like to remove an irrigation ditch that was constructed by the previous owner. Um, that has become over time really a really nice uh, salmon habitat. So they are proposing to remove that ditch and enhance habitat on the property through constructing additional side channels, off channel bores, and riparian restoration works. <clears throat> so, yeah, if anyone's familiar with Pemberton Meadows, this is up from uh, up to the northwest of Pemberton itself. Um, very uh, low lying area. And at some point, the previous owner had constructed an irrigation ditch through the middle of the property that diverts flow from an adjacent creek and um, unintentionally created excellent salmon habitat. Um, so the new owner would like to remove this, this ditch because it limits the use, their use of the property or their preferred use of the property and also in, increases flood risk um, to the location where they would like to build their house. So similar process, the habitat impacts were assessed and quantified. So determined a residual impact of about 5,000 square meters of aquatic habitat and proposed enhancement of about 20,000. So they're uh, proposing to replace more than is being impacted. Um, the designs, this may, this may appear similar to the Mount Poly work and that, that, was, that was by design. Um, we wanna provide a similar um, habitat enhancement work. So this is habitat creation because we're creating, um, we're creating a habitat where it's currently terrestrial area through the construction of side channels and side channel pools um, and using weirs and riffles to um, another channel complexing features to en enhance the habitat value in the area. Um, and just yeah, in, in cross section, this is what the, the pores look like. Um, similar to, to Mount Pali, this, this isn't showing the, the woody debris, but similar kind of morphology with the graded pools, um, creek gravels, woody debris and boulders, and uh, yeah, a significant increase in um, Habitat area. So these designs have been submitted to DFO and FLINRO through the request for review process and section 11 application under the Water Sustainability Act and we're waiting to hear back. So hopefully this will get built in the summer and that's all my slides. Um, so yeah, so I hope that was useful. I, uh, I think the, the case study showed a good range of, of application of those regulations from like I say, from a large mine to a proposed infrastructure development to um, a private property. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions either now or, or later, you have my contact details and feel free to reach out.